So today we are covering a basic self-timed pipeline stage. Uh, this will be building off of the um, kind of most basic self-timed circuit that we built last time. Uh, remember last time we had a source on the left and a sink on the right communicating over a channel C. Uh, and the channel has a requests rail and a, an enable rail uh, that you know, when, you're, when you want to send information from one to the next, you raise the request rail, and then when you're done processing that information, you lower the enable rail. And then it's the inverse uh, of those transitions to reset the channel. And so now we want to stick a uh, buffer in between the, the source and the sink. It's a, a single pipeline stage uh, that will act uh, later as some computation stage that we want to execute. And so we'll give ourselves a little space here, and then uh, we're going to stick that buffer right in. Uh, and now we've got two different channels. We split C into a left channel, L, and a right channel, R. And the CHP in the middle uh, is, so this is a language called communicating hardware processes. We've gone over production rules, and we've gone over handshaking expansions. Uh, we've talked a little bit about communicating hardware processes. This is just saying uh, send, or sorry, receive on L, then send on R and do so repeatedly. And so we're going to take uh, token after token from L, and then we're going to just forward them straight on to R. Now, in order to do that, uh, we need to work our way down from CHP back to production rules. So we'll give ourselves a little space in this specification. And then, like we uh, did in reverse last time, we're going to take this uh, L receive, this little bit of syntactic sugar, and we're going to expand it out into uh, handshaking expansions. And so this is just saying, wait for a request on L, and then lower the enable to signify, hey, I got the data then wait for the request to be reset on L, then lower the enable, or sorry, then raise the enable to signify, I have already received the next value. We're gonna do the same thing for R. So the send on R is we're gonna raise the request rail on R. Then we're gonna wait for the enable on R to lower, signifying that the receiver is done with the data. Then we're gonna lower the request rail on R and then we're gonna wait for the enable on R to raise, signifying that the receiver is ready to receive data again. Now we're gonna be walking you through um, what's called formal synthesis. Uh, this, this is gonna be a very kind of quick overview of formal synthesis. We're not gonna to get too much into the weeds. We'll do that in uh, the third module. So the next step is now that we have handshaking uh, expansions, we need to uh, optimize those handshaking expansions to produce a circuit that is going to be performant uh, or optimize energy or optimize circuit area. We're going to kind of massage this specification to optimize whatever thing that we want to optimize. And so the, fir the first thing that we can see is these two lines, uh, the guard on L.R going low, followed by raising L.E followed by raising R dot R, and then waiting for R dot E to go low. These two lines, if we switch them, uh, it takes this full buffer specification and it, and it turns it into a half buffer. Now, what do I mean by that? So if we look at a full buffered pipeline, when tokens are traversing the pipeline, they come in, uh, and in order for them to move from one space to the next, they need a space to move into which means that as they're traversing the pipeline, you see a token every other space in the pipeline. Now, if they come across this node at the end that's blocked, it's waiting on some other signal, then a full buffer will allow these tokens to kind of pile up behind that uh, with a token filling every single channel in the pipeline. Then when that process gets unblocked, they, need to wait for space in the pipeline to move out and so they spread back out again like you would see on like a highway a half buffer 
traverses the pipeline the same way, right? We have spaces in the pipeline for tokens to move into. However, when it gets to this blockage, it doesn't let the tokens kind of... Um, instead, the tokens stay kind of stuck in that every other channel formation. Then when it gets unblocked, all the tokens can move immediately. And so that's the big difference between a half buffer and a full buffer is the total amount of storage space in the pipeline. Uh, passive, you know, like uh, resting storage space. Uh, when things are moving, they ultimately have the same amount of, uh, kind of space in the pipeline. But when things are at rest, a full buffer will have twice as much space as a half. And so why does switching these two lines uh, make it a full buffer instead of a half buffer? Well, it will get into that a bit in the uh, formal synthesis methods in module three. And so for now, we're just going to accept that that is the case. The next thing that we notice is that if we look at two assignments in sequence, L.E down and R.R up, being driven from this process, and we look at what an external observer might see if they were connected to those two wires. Those two wires may be different lengths, and they may be drastically different lengths, which may change the order in which an external observer might see those two transitions, regardless of what order we transition them in from within inside the process. Right? So if we transition L.E low first, and then R.R .R high, if the wire for L.E out to the external observer is much longer than the wire for R.R .R, then the external observer may see the transition on R.R .R first, in which case it ultimately doesn't matter what order we as a process here execute those transitions. So we can switch them around to our heart's content. So, and we can do that for the reset phase as well. So we switch those as well. Now we have this semi-regular uh, handshake expansion, but we can still do one more thing to clean it up. And that is we have a guard at the very end of the loop. And much like in software, we can roll the loop in hardware. So we can take this guard from the end and move it up to the beginning of the loop and it implements ultimately the same circuit. And so now we have wait for r.e and l.r, then raise r.r, then lower l.e, then wait for both r.e and l.r to go low, then lower r.r and raise r.e. So are there any questions so far? Okay. All right, so we have our handshaking expansion for the half buffer. Um, now we need to take this kind of optimized handshaking expansion and turn it into a set of production rules. Uh, we're skipping a whole part of the uh, formal synthesis methods where we need to look for state conflicts and insert state variable transitions. That gets very complicated and buffers most of the time don't really need it. And so we're going to run a, an algorithm called guard strengthening. And guard strengthening will look at a transition one at a time and look at all of the predicates, all of these kind of required pieces of state in the guards um, in order for the transition to be executed. And so we'll take a look at uh, R.R .R first uh let's get that so this handshaking expansion uh, on the right here we have a, a rendering kind of of the transitions on the wires of the handshaking expansion right we have uh art we wait for r.e to go up we wait for l.r to go up and then once those are both true we can raise r.r and then once r.r is raised we can lower l.e then that triggers transitions on l.r and r.e uh, those both lower in parallel, and then once that's done, we can lower R.R and raise L.E. 
So if we're going to walk these product these transitions to produce production rules, we're going to start with R dot R up. Now R dot R up before that occurs, we must guarantee that R dot E is high and L dot R is high. And so our production rule uh, in a pretty straightforward way is R dot E and L dot R triggers R dot R high. Now we can also add L dot E up, that wouldn't hurt anything. It would just make our circuit a little slower and we ultimately don't need it to disambiguate the state beyond what we've got. Uh, so then we look at the next production rule, L dot E. And so the only requirement for L dot E is that R dot R is high. There's no other state in which uh, R dot R is high and L dot E must be high. And so that's our next production rule, R dot, wait for R dot R, then lower L dot E. And then we can keep doing the same thing. So we look at R dot R low and the two guards leading into R dot R low are lower, you know, we're waiting for R dot E to lower and we're waiting for L dot R to lower. So not R dot E and not L dot R triggers R dot R low. And then finally, the last rule, if R dot R is low, then we raise L dot E just like the other one. So we've generated production rules. Any questions on the, the kind of general procedure We'll get into a lot of a lot more detail about this procedure in module three, but kind of so far, uh, how are we feeling about this process? Now we've got a thumbs up. All right. Uh, so now we need to produce gates. So we've got these production rules, and we've got this weird gate here on R dot R. This is called a Euler C element. And ultimately it is what is synchronizing the cycles in a self time circuit. And so let's generate this gate um, with transistors to kind of show you what it looks like. So let's start from the left side here with um, R dot E and we're gonna produce an NMOS transistor uh, and connect it to ground. So we've got an NMOS transistor for R dot E connected to ground. Then we shift over to L dot R to produce our next NMOS transistor. Then we shift down to this not L dot R to produce our PMOS and this not R dot E to produce our next PMOS. Then we've got this uh, weird thing where we have R dot E and L dot R, those are NMOS transistors, but it's driving R dot R high, which is not, you know, which is uh, since CMOS is inverting, we need to put another gate in between there. And so we add an inverter between uh, the driving gate we've got here and uh, the output node R dot R with this internal node underscore RR to kind of handle our inverting part of the CMOS specification. So if we look at the behavior of this gate, then we've got kind of two states that are driven. If R dot E and L dot R are low, then uh, that channel is connected all the way up to VDD and under our internal node underscore RR is driven high, which drives our output node low. Similarly, if we look at the NMOS transistors, if both L dot R and R dot E are one, then current uh, charges drained from uh, our internal node underscore RR and um, our output node is driven to one. Problem is, if they disagree, if RE and LR aren't the same value, then our, our internal node underscore RR is not driven. It is left to float. And our inverter will amplify any kind of variation on that internal node uh, out to RR and it will cause all, all sorts of madness in our in state machine. So we need an extra gate to drive this internal node. There are two ways to do this. The first is with weak feedback. If we add a really weak inverter coming backwards from our output node to our internal node, then whenever we want to change the value, our driving gate here will overwhelm this feedback inverter and write the value. 
And then when it's not driving, it, this feedback inverter will hold the previous value. So if they if RIE and L.R. disagree, then our internal node will be driven by the inverse of whatever our output node last was. However, uh, this will it depend depending upon the sizing between the sizing difference between the uh, driving gate here and the feedback. Uh, this can really slow down the circuit, and so. It will also effectively you've got the short across the transistors in this feedback inverter. So if you don't want that short, then you can also condition the feedback on the inverse uh, expression of the driving gate, right? So this won't drive the internal node high if unless uh, one of these two nodes is low, which would turn off this series transistor, uh, the NMOS stack. Which means that now your driving gate will never fight the feedback. So this is generally good when um, your uh, driving stack is sized much greater than your uh, feedback, uh, because otherwise your feedback is going to effectively double the gate capacitance on this gate, and it'll slow it down by a factor of two. So that's a Mueller C element. Uh, this is the gate symbol for it. And we've hooked it up to our circuit. Any questions so far? How are we feeling about that? Okay, I'm going to take silence as, as we're good. Okay. So then we've got our uh, other gate on L.E. We've seen this before in the uh, source and the sink. It's just an inverter. So we're connecting it from R.R .R here down to L.E here. And there it is. So we've just gone through a full compilation of the weak condition half buffer. This is the simplest pipeline stage that we can build in a cell time circuit. Notice that there are two interacting cycles of gates, right? So our first cycle is here. It's five gates long, right? Because the C, this C element is two gates. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this is an odd number of gates, right? Because any even number of gates will stabilize and then we'll hold its value. Uh, then on the, our other side, on the sink side, we've got the C element representing two gates, and then the sink representing one, so a total of three, uh, also an odd number of gates. And this C element is ultimately synchronizing these two cycles. So it waits for these two cycles to be in the same location in their execution before continuing on and allowing them both to go. So that's the weak condition half buffer. Um, and there's one more kind of uh, tidbit uh, that we need to take care of, and that is the C element is state holding. So when we boot up the chip, we need to figure out some kind of initial state for that C element. So this initial state can come from our reset signals. We've got a variety of reset, sig reset signals in our uh, global specification in our global structure. Um, the first is just kind of it's underscore reset. And so it's the so underscore reset is low when reset is high. It's the inverse. And so if we want to reset our output node low, we would kind of and in this reset signal, this the the underscore reset to the upgoing rule to prevent it from firing during reset. And then we'd OR in the inverse of the reset signal in the downgoing rule to force it low on reset. Does that make sense? OK. If we know that R.E or L.R 
are going to start low as a result of some other reset signal somewhere in the circuit, then we don't need that extra protection here and we can remove it. In that case, we need to switch our reset signal down here to the parallel reset. This is raised after, or sorry, this is lowered after our other reset signals. And so we need to give it time. Uh, we need to give it time for the, the reset signals to stabilize blocking this production rule so we don't cause a short when we're initializing a chip. So we have an extra kind of reset signal to, to handle that timing problem. However, you generally don't want to do this. Um, it's generally more straightforward to do this. So you might do this if, say, the transistor stack is too long as a result of more complicated expressions uh, in the state machine, and kind of this is your last ditch effort. If we want to reset with r dot r high, then we do the opposite. So we have a, a just a normal reset signal. We and in the not of the reset to the downgoing rule to protect our circuit from kind of a short during reset. And then we or in the reset here on R uh, to force it high. And similarly, if we look at uh, kind of removing that lower rule, if we know that either R.E or L.R will be will start high on reset, then we don't need that extra production protection. So that covers this lecture. Um, let's get into examples. So we're in lecture three. Uh, if we look at E1, then we've got our source specification and our sync from our previous examples. And we've added this weak condition half buffer pipeline stage that we want to implement. We are instantiating both the source and the sink down here at the bottom. We've got two channels, L and R. We're connecting the source up to channel L. Then we're connecting the channel L up to the receiving end on the WCHB here. Then we're connecting R up to the output of the WCHB and then out to the sink. So our goal is to implement this WCHB. Um, so we've got the first production rule here um, on RR. And then we're going to lower LE, right? So we have R dot R, L dot E down. Then we're going to do our, our reset phase. So not R dot E and not L dot R underscore R, R, up. That's our internal node. Yep, you got it working. Um, then we're going to take our internal node, underscore R, R, and lower our output node, R, dot R. And finally, we're going to reset the input enable. So not R, dot R, L, dot E, up. Now, this first example is designed to have to work without reset rules because of the resource file that's added here. It sets the resets, which means that we can just make E1, PRSIM, E1.PRS, source E1.RC. And we can see our circuits start to operate. All right, so after reset, we our script sets r.e and l dot r low. And then when reset is released, our script our uh, our buffer starts running. So our internal node goes to one, our uh, output node goes low, right? We're still doing the the circuit is still kind of 
uh, stabilizing after reset. Um, and then finally, L.R goes high, driving underscore RR low, driving R.R high. And so our first request runs its way through the circuit. Then we see r.ego low and l.ego low in parallel. Then we see as a result of l.egoing low, the source lowers the request. And as a result of r.egoing low and a lowered request on l.r, our buffer lowers its request. And finally, the cha both channels reset. And then we start the next cycle with LRR. But so you can see that in the analog simulation, you PRSIM env.prs source prsim.rc. It boots up Spice, runs through the netlist, does a simulation, and now we've got test.spy.prn, right, which is just all of our voltage values. So if we PR view test.spy.prn to open up the waveform viewer, then we can take a look at some of these signals. So we've got the request on L, we've got the enable on L, then we've got the request on R, and we've got the enable on R. So you can see the enable on L and the request on R kind of happen almost in parallel. Uh, we can zoom in and see more of a difference in time, but it's roughly the same. And so an external observer may not be able to tell the difference or, you know, wire delays will offset those from each other quite a bit in any direction. Our um, signals L.R and R.E are driven by the test bench, right? So by the digital simulations, we've got these nice kind of trapezoidal transitions. Uh, and the ones, the two uh, inside here, we've got LE and R are driven by our buffer. And so you, you, you see how they kind of line up. Uh, the first transition happens here with L.R going high, causing uh, our uh, output node, RR, to go high. I'm going to actually pull in our internal node here. And I'm going to put it uh, right next to our output, um, our output node. And I'm going to change its color. So this is going to be, our output node's going to be red. Okay, so our input request Our input request goes high, our internal node goes low, our output node goes high, and then our input enable goes low. And then on, re on the reset phase, you notice that there's this long kind of raise on the uh, internal node here. I haven't added any sizing on this example. So these transistors are all just kind of whatever the default size is, and the default size for PMOS is very, very small. And so you've got this really you know, bad transition here. Uh, I will show you sizing uh, in a later lecture uh, once we get to the more advanced circuitry. Um, but you can kind of work on that transition and optimize it a bit to make it cleaner with an increase in sizing. Um, but kind of this is the, if you, if you add combinational feedback rather than weak feedback, you may see this more or less. Right, so kind of play around with the circuit whenever you're working with this, look at the transitions, make sure that they're clean uh, and monotonic. Okay, so that's the first example. Then we can run through our second, which adds the reset rules. So if we look at E2.act, it looks a lot like E1. So we kind of write our, our rules again, our E and L that are, 
underscore r down, not underscore r r. Up, r I'll let you down. So this is just like our previous example. All right, so there are production rules from our previous example. And we need to add reset. So if we want to reset r dot r low, then we want to block this production rule. So this would be g dot underscore reset and. And so when reset is high, this production will, rule will not fire. And so r dot r will, so underscore r r, our internal node, cannot be lowered, which means our output node r dot r cannot be raised. And then in order to make sure that it's forced to that value, we can say not g dot underscore reset or. And so on reset, this signal will be low, the inverse of it will be high, and this will fire. So we can make E2. Now we have E2.PRS, so we have PR sim. If we look at E2.RC, we'll notice down at the bottom here we don't muck about with the values um, on L, R, or R, E, right? So if we look at uh, U1.RC, L, R, and R, E were reset low to force a value in the buffer. But now we don't do that. So PRSIM E2.PRS, source PRSIM.RC, uh, sorry, source E2.RC, and it runs. So we go through the reset phase. Um, we let everything kind of stabilize after reset. And then we deassert reset, and our circuit's allowed to run. So we see the same transitions that we saw before. L, you know, the input request is raised, the output request goes high, the output enable goes low, the input enable goes low. Right? It's the same handshake. The reset behavior is just different, right? Because it's actually using the reset signals rather than uh, kind of forced transitions on our uh, test bench. So we can see the analog behavior once again with two. PRSIM env.prs source prsim.rc. Boots up Zeiss, reads the netlist, runs our simulation. And we can say PR view test.spy.prn. And we bring up our waveform viewer again. I'm going to pull in the input request. I'm going to pull in the input enable, the output request, our internal node, and the um, output enable. And then I'm going to pull in our reset signal, underscore reset, and there it is. And so for this first part of the simulation, from zero to roughly eight nanoseconds, our reset, our underscore reset, right? So this is the inverse of reset, is held low, meaning we are resetting the chip. So during that time, our underscore RR rule is forced high as a result of the reset signal which drives our output request low. Then once our reset signal is deasserted, uh, we already have a request, an input request on L, and so we just start operating, right? So our internal node goes low, our output request goes high, and then our input enable goes low almost immediately. There is a decent amount of delay on the environment 
in order to kind of show this happen. If you want to see it kind of run without any limitations on speed, then you're going to want to add a couple more uh, buffers in that in that pipeline in order to kind of see a more accurate interaction. And then you can cut down on the timing by looking at, if we look at Pearson.rc and we have this random 0, 010, we can reduce that to random 0, 01. And it will run way faster simply because the environment is no longer limiting the speed of, of execution. Bring this up again. And we've got the, the input request, the input enable, the output request, the internal rule, the output enable. Generally, in a 28 nanometer process technology node, uh, these will run at about 2 gigahertz. Uh, this is a 130 nanometer technology node, so it'll run quite a bit slower than that. At the moment, it looks like we're able to run at around 1 gigahertz. <laughs> 